Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Michael Cahill of 310 Forge. I met Michael during check-in at the Texas Custom Knife Show in early November this year. He commented on my Arnie watch, and I commented on the multiple forged bowies he had tucked into his belt and coming out of his backpack. Uh, I ended up spending a good bit of time bending Michael's ear and checking out each blade at his table multiple times. The historically based bowies and other knives I wanted there were a little bit out of my reach at the time, uh, but I did was not able to leave Michael's table without getting something uh, in his in his rugged and refined American style. So I got this mini scalper, a knife that has turned into a favorite uh, EDC fixed blade knife. We'll talk to Michael about his life in the forge. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell and download the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you want to help support it, Go to the uh, go to the Patreon page. Uh, quickest way to do that is to go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon or scan the QR code on the screen. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Michael, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Hey, before we get started, I, I, I usually like to ask uh, if it's not readily apparent uh, what the significance of of people's makers mark, what their names mean. 310 Forge. What is that? Right. So there's uh, it's from the Bible. Joel 310. Joel 310. It is turn your plowshares into spears, your pruning hooks into swords and let the weak say I am mighty. And. There are some other verses that I liked better that fit the motif better, but we're talking about a business name here. So I had to pick one that happened to also be a memorable name. Numbers are memorable to people. 310. It sounds like an area code. It's easy to remember and then forge. So it's a great way to share a Bible verse, share uh, kind of the very basic philosophy of my business. And then, uh, it's just it's just the name that that ended up sticking well it's a good name and it 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 is catchy but you say uh, the philosophy of your business oh uh, how would you encapsulate that sure so the number one philosophy of my business comes from scripture everything that i do business wise goes back to scripture as a believer in jesus christ i am required by god's law and i'm I am compelled by the Holy Spirit to be honest in my business dealings and to provide the best product that I possibly can and not cheat people. Uh, so my goal is make a good knife, glorify God with my product. And that's why I chose that name. Yeah, I love that. Uh, glorify God with your product. That's uh, I like that. That's a very seems a very worthy goal uh, for any business. Um, but I like especially hearing that uh, for a knife company, uh, especially a knife company that is, you know, makes some unabashed weapons. You look at them, uh, some I, of those buoys. Absolutely. We can't uh, we can't forget. Everybody likes to think of Jesus as this wandering hippie who said nice things. But let's not forget. He also said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. So what is it? the sword of the spirit and the whole old testament talks about battles wars i mean one of my favorite stories is david killing goliath with his own sword taking that sword and keeping it for himself so <laughs> we yeah. uh bible's filled with warriors and mighty men who are unashamed of it now today i don't believe that we are to be actively engaging and going out and trying to kill people things like that no but i believe the man of god has every right to defend himself and why not if i'm gonna make knives people are like you're a christian you shouldn't make weapons i'm sorry can you can you tell me a bible verse that says that i shouldn't <laughs> yeah and uh from from hanging out at your uh table and talking um you've read the bible quite a good many times so you you are uh 
<laughs> you'd be hard pressed to find someone who could find that uh, verse and prove what you're doing is wrong. Um, of course, it's so right. And uh, I'm so psyched about this mini scalper. And actually, something that I was not expecting is how much I love the sheath. Um, I EDC knives every day, uh, fixed blade knives, mm -hmm. and they all go in, except with one exception, they all go into Kydex. And to have a um, on top of the belt leather sheath um, that works this well, that was so that acts so discreetly um, has been great. Uh, tell me about your style. We know your philosophy, but tell me about the style. I said that to me, it's sort of like a, uh, an American, all American style. To me, this is like classic little American knife. But tell, tell me about the style of your work. Sure. So let's just talk about the mini scalper for a minute because I've got, I've got my own right here. <laughs> this one. Mm -hmm. uh, my mini scalper, I like uh, G10 on the handles. Adds a little bit more weight. And I, my hands get nasty and muddy and, and dirty while I'm working in the forge. So the G10 is kind of the only option the, for me as a carry knife. So I like the G10. This particular design, I, I, I was always reading knife books when I was a kid. Every time I went to Barnes and Nobles or to a bookstore with my parents, I'd pick up one of those books that just had pictures and pictures of knives and swords and all kinds of things. And I always was, I always, my I was drawn to uh, 17th century early American blades. I loved the Bowie knives, the stag handled knives. I loved the, the daggers, the Native American knives. And that's where the mini scalper comes from. Uh, the mini scalper, uh, the blade is shaped like your typical English trade knife. So we came over here from England with lots and lots of um, things that were desirable to the Native Americans because they were still in the Stone Age. They weren't making their own metal or th they didn't have uh, they didn't have their own smiths. If they had it, it was because it was iron that fell from the sky and they pounded it into useful tools with a rock and hot and hot coals. So when we came over with refined tools, they really liked them. And the English would trade this style blade shape to them, usually a little bit longer in the four to five inch range. What I did is I took the handle and I said, I want something compact that doesn't go outside the waistline when I'm wearing it or something that I can have inside my jeans pocket. And no matter where I grab it, I want to be able to have a purchase on it. And I originally designed this to be a self-defense tool, a something that would go in the pocket as a backup weapon. And it became my best seller. <laughs> all the mm -hmm. knives, all the helpers that you saw at the, the show, I don't have those anymore. They're all gone. I'm working on more for my next show. But it's, I mean, it's, it's an incredible value for, uh, you know, 85 to $125. So it's one of my favorite knives. It gets, it goes on my belt every morning when I go to work. So <laughs> I, I uh, carry it set up for um, right hand reverse grip. It comes out like this perfectly. And to me, I think it, it yeah, it's a great self-defense weapon. I also like the teardrop shaped handle because uh, it really nestles in your palm. It doesn't have to be a full four finger grip uh, right. because of how bulbous it is at the end. Um, mm -hmm. You get a, you get a full uh, fist of it. And the blade is very thin and it's kind of scandy ground in a way. Um, yep. in a, in a sense, because, well, maybe not in a sense, it, exactly Scandi ground. Uh, the blade steel is so thin. It's almost like you couldn't do it another way. I love how slicey this is. Yeah. It's uh one sixteenth of an inch thick. The blade steel is 15 and 20, which is, I, I guess metallurgically it's very similar to 1075, but it has the addition of nickel. And most people have heard the name 15 and 20, but don't equate it with knife steel on its own. And I don't see a lot of people using 15 and 20 by itself for knife steel. So it's something that sets me apart a little bit. I don't know a lot of knife makers using it for anything but Damascus. And that's okay. the steel for Damascus. And uh, for me, I have a great source of it. I'm not going to tell anybody where I get it. But <laughs> the reason that I can charge the prices that I charge is because I get a lot of this very affordably. So it, it uh, I started using it. I played around with the heat treat on this knife for a good two years before I finally got it 
just the recipe to make it so that it's flexible. It's tough, holds an edge, but you can resharpen it. Yeah, I, I've gotten mine uh, so incredibly sharp. Uh, I, I almost nervously sharp or strop things just out of fun for fun. It's not like I doled it out or anything, but I've gotten this incredibly sharp. Uh, you put a you put a sharp edge on it when you gave it to me. You touched it up. And then, mm -hmm. of course, I had to do my own. Um, but uh, yeah, I've, I, I really like this knife a lot. And it makes me think of the bigger knives at your table that I was really um, kind of gushing over. Um, the, the Bowie knives. Uh, yeah. Tell me about those knives. Show us some of them and uh, and how it is or what it is about the Bowie knife uh, that is such a um, a draw. Well, I'm a Texan. Bowie knives, I think, are just in my blood. <laughs> I And before I was a Texan, I was in Montana. And Montana, you've also got Bowie knife. And I think you think of, uh, when I think knife, the first thing that comes to my mind is either a K-bar, which is a Bowie knife, or like this old Winchester tin poster that I saw of a guy facing off a bear. <laughs> and he had a he had a Winchester rifle in his hand and then a Bowie knife in the other. So for me, it's just what a knife is. Everything else is a tool. A Bowie knife is iconic. And this is this is my favorite one. Uh, the, um, the big old Bowie knife, <laughs> uh. 12 inch blade, uh, purple heartwood handle and brass guard. It is heavy, weighs one pound, 10 ounces, but I balance these about an inch, inch and a half in front of the guard. So you have the ability to, to use it, but also how you shape the handles important so that you can, you can actually wield a large knife like that. This is, this is the most unrealistic Bowie knife that I make. Uh, I I don't really make anything a lot bigger than this. I will make swords from time to time, but as far as Bowie knives go, this is my favorite. This is my favorite style. Historically, it's it's not super significant, but it is iconic. And when people see it, they go, "That's a Bowie knife." <laughs> <laughs> when you say unrealistic, do you mean uh, the the hardest to fight with, or what do you mean by unrealistic? I think unrealistic because I can't think of a reasonable way to carry this knife without making people really nervous. Mm -hmm. And so it's an unrealistic weapon today as a, as a, as a weapon. Now you could take this into combat. Obviously I've made, I made one knife that was bigger than this. It had no guard. I called it the bad day buoy and it was given to, officer um as a gift from his from his unit and the thing has a 15 inch blade it was ridiculously huge it weighed way too much but they just loved it they go he's gonna love this for hog hunting and um i mean if you can think about it any any movie that you've seen the most probably the largest knife that you've seen is like this in the expendables right yeah yeah just about i haven't seen in combat uh movies anything this large except in the alamo and expendables why it's just not a reasonable size knife to carry into combat anymore the other tools that we have at our disposal so for me it's unrealistic it's fun it's beautiful it's what i think of when i think buoy knife but if i was going to going to carry something it would be a a smaller knife i do have the knife my my buoy knife that i carry daily if you'd like to see that as well yeah i'd love to see that this this is my carry buoy oh. this is a a nine and a half inch blade it's much slimmer compared to this here i'll show you them side by side so here's the the muso style buoy and here's here's the one i carry so very very <laughs> a lot slimmer let's put it that way a lot slimmer a lot lighter this weighs eight ounces so if you're familiar with cold steel knives cold steel's spartan knife weighs nine ounces this weighs the same as an open spartan and that has to do with the, the blade, the way that it's beveled, the way that I I made the tang and the handle and the guard so that everything's balanced. And the balance point on this knife is right in front of the choil. So you have a lot more control near the hand and it's a lot more lively in the hand so you can move it quicker. The, the top cut is only sharpened to about here. 
where it will actually shave hairs. The rest of it is partially sharpened, so it will cut. So this to me would be a more reasonable weapon. I can carry this in my belt. And I believe I saw a video of you the other day talking about you had a jacket on. You were talking about how you carry your fixed blades mm -hmm. in the belt. Uh, you carry it on the side where you can draw reverse grip. I carry this like that. So oh, nice. it, this waist, and most people don't most people don't recognize that I have it on. And it's one that comes out only if it's a bad day. I've never had to draw it on somebody, thankfully. Uh, but this is this is the knife that I carry because I made it uh, specifically after I lost my daughter uh, to a miscarriage a few months back. This was my this was the knife I poured all my grief into. This was the first knife I made with my hydraulic press, and it's got an ebony handle. My father helped me forge the Damascus, so we actually wow. forged forge weld together by hand with sledgehammer and <laughs> and just elbow grease. And then the rest of it was done, um, done with the press, but it's a, it's a very special knife. It's one that goes with me everywhere. And I think this would be a more reasonable Bowie knife to carry. Oh it's, yeah. It's somewhere between a, a cold steel trail master and the, the slim profile of a Laredo Bowie. Yes, yes, uh, I, I have, and I'm, I'm huge fans of both of those. Uh, but the one knife uh, that comes to mind before both of those actually is the Bill Bagwell Hell's Bells Bowie, uh, and yes. and uh, and associated, uh, it, you know, those long, slender fighting buoys. I, I I go back and forth. Uh, I grew up saying Bowie, but I I understand I need to say Bowie. Um, yeah, that Here's long, a long, slender. Oh yeah. Yeah. So right. this is, this is, um, hell's bell style buoy that I made, uh, ironwood handle. I believe I had this one at the, at yeah. the Texas show with the brass guard, uh, ironwood handles, coffin handle. And this is even lighter. This weighs six ounces altogether. So it's a very light buoy knife. Everyone picks this up and they go, wow, that's, that's light. <laughs> yeah. But, Yes, this is. I think this is a reasonable size Bowie knife to carry if you're in Texas and you're allowed to by law. <laughs> you know, by law in a lot of places, you're allowed to walk around with a a large fixed blade knife on your hip. Um, for instance, where I live, legally I could, but uh, there are so many pearl clutchers or in this area, uh, people would freak out and and it would it would just be a problem. But legally speaking, it's good to know uh, that you're pretty much within your rights in most places to walk around uh, with a belt knife. Um, right. So I want to ask you uh, how you got into the actual, uh, well, into the craft of forging and into the, uh, in, this is now your career. This is now what you do. But how did you get into it? Sure. So I grew up, I love knives. I have since I was a little kid. My grandfather is a famous knife maker. Well, it, if you ask people today who he is, they have no idea. But he used to be a famous knife maker back in the day. He made uh, small folding knives and he was a master engraver. So his folding knives would go for thousands, thousands of dollars. So he'd sell a knife for 4,000, go out in the hallway. Somebody would, would sell it again for double that to another collector. And uh, so I would go to knife shows with them. And I remember going to the knife show and meeting Gil Hibben uh, and Bob Loveless. And that's kind of when I found, wow, you know, I, there are a lot of different types of knives out there. So then I was hooked. I was a kid who just was hooked on knives and I would buy every little knife that I possibly could. I had Swiss Army knives. I had all the Walmart specials, the Walmart Bowie knives. And you know what? I broke every single one of them. I don't have any knives from my childhood left. They're all broken. <laughs> <laughs> when I got to college and I really, I had some spare change because I was working. I realized I can afford better knives or I could modify ones that I do have and see if I can make them the way that I like. And I believe I modified a, I took the handle off of a, an Ontario Marine Raider buoy, the one with the ugly rubber handle. Mm -hmm. And I, I stripped the paint off of it, put a new guard and put a, a handle on that one. And I kind of got the itch for crafting. So I made a sheath for it and I go, oh yeah, I think I like. This. So 
I asked my brother, who was a journeyman blacksmith in Montana, if he would be willing to teach me the basics of blacksmithing. And he just, he loved that idea. So we bought some cigars and I bought us beers and we, uh, we dug a hole in the backyard, put a pipe in the ground, filled it with uh, oak lump charcoal and a hair dryer. And we made a forge right oh, there. Wow. We Arbor Freight and bought a $50 anvil and some $6 hammers. And he taught me how to do it. And I was hooked. The minute I did my first taper on a piece of rebar, I was absolutely hooked. So it became a hobby. And about a year after I started making knives, my first knife was terrible, but I still have it. I still have it. I wish I had it here with me so I could show y'all. It's, it's basically just a squished railroad spike <laughs> <laughs> with a sharp edge. I use it as a hot cut tool in the forge. I'm never getting rid of it. It's, uh, it, it was just a hobby. I didn't plan on making it a business, just something to do to keep my hands busy because I, I went to college and I, I hated being an academic, but I was really good at being an academic, <laughs> but I didn't, I don't like, I don't like the academic lifestyle, just sitting behind a desk and writing or studying or researching. I can do that. And I do it quite often because I, I, I do preach, I do teach and I do a, I do quite a bit of that still. However, that's now my hobby. And my, my life is, is the knife making. So, uh, it was, it was just a fun thing to do. And then when I got married, my, my wife and I needed some extra cash. I got a, I got a new truck. So we needed 500 bucks extra a month for making car payments. So hmm. we wondered, would I be able to get just an extra $500 a month? Could I sell a couple knives and make that extra 500 bucks a month? I go, well, I have a background in sales. I'm sure I could scrounge up. 500 bucks worth of customers for my knives. So in a month I would make a handful of knives and try to sell them and 500 bucks came pretty easy. Now we also, you know, pray for our daily bread also. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think God's going to leave us hanging if there's expenses that actually absolutely need to be paid. We, we completely trust him. But I also believe that a man should work. And if a man doesn't work, he ought not eat. So I went and I did it and we kept making the 500 other car, car payments. And I go, I wonder if I could just make a few more knives and make a few more dollars. And turned out I could. At that point, I'm trying to be a school teacher. I'm doing my certification in Texas and everything. I'm doing all the all the paperwork. I'm working at uh, the school. So I'd work for, at the school from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then come home and work in the workshop until midnight. And it was just exhausting. And pretty soon, I replaced my income at the school. And I go... Kaz, I wonder if we could do this full time. And she goes, yeah, you can. And my father-in-law encouraged me. Um, my parents were so sure about it at the, at first they go, Oh no, our son's going to try to be an artist. Oh, he's never made money. <laughs> and, uh, it, it turned out great. We replaced all our income at the school. So I put in my two weeks and they, they kind of looked at me like, you're never, you're like, you you can make more money as a teacher. Why would you, why would you stop? I said, you guys passed me up for two teaching positions, which technically I was overqualified for. And I, I made $8,000 this month. And the principal goes, you make that much making knives? I'm like, yeah. He goes, good luck. <laughs> so that was, that was the beginning of it. And I started off making 10 knives a month. And now I'm I'm somewhere in the neighborhood of 80, 80 to 90 knives a month that I put out of my workshop. Wow. Jeez. 80 to 90 uh, knives a month. How, what percentage of them are forged? Uh, so the mini scalpers and the, 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 uh, so if you look on my website or if you look on my Facebook page, any of the knives that have the 15 and 20 steel, like the mini scalper, those are stock mm -hmm. removal. And I do all the heat treating, all the tempering. But I will, I will cut the blade shapes out. I have patterns that I cut the blade shapes out. Uh, anything other than those, it's all forged. Everything wow. other. Wow. So I have, a, I have a production line. If you stop on the page, on the web page there, the knives in the very center of the screen, those are called the Cognito. Same blade as the mini scalper, a little bit of a longer handle. I haven't made those in a while for... They, they kind of went out of vogue. They stopped selling, so I stopped making them for a bit. I'll come back to them at some point. Uh, but everything else is forged. Everything else is done on the anvil. Man, so, okay. So 
who are you selling these to? How did this catch on? Uh, you said you have a, a background in sales, which um, before before we get on to your customer and, and how you sell to them, uh, this is an important thing that uh, Doug Markheida brought up. Uh, you probably didn't hear because you were there selling knives at your table. But uh, when Doug Markheida was on the stage talking uh, to knife makers, one of his uh, bits of advice was uh, get a business degree. You know, it, you have a passion for knife making. You know that you have that and you know that you're making good knives, but you still have to know how to sell them. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, you're an artist toiling in obscurity. <laughs> you know, no one wants to be that. So uh, I thought that was great advice. You have a background in sales. How did you use that, leverage that to gain customers? Because uh, I would imagine in a in a business like knife making, it could be feast or famine depending on the month. So my background in sales is actually a failed background in sales. I My first job out of college was selling health insurance and I was abysmal at it. <laughs> I knew how to sell, but I knew how to sell products that I believed in and I didn't believe mm -hmm. that I was selling. So I just couldn't sell it. I wasn't making any money doing it. I think I went three months without a paycheck and go, okay, that's, a, that's enough. <laughs> it was all commissions based. However, I, I love talking to people. I'm a very much a people person and I didn't know that about myself until I started trying to sell things. And it turns out I really genuinely care about the person that I'm selling to and I want them to get something for their money because I personally, when I buy something, I want value. I want value. I do not want to just spend my money on something that I'm going to throw away later. I hate that about our economy. I hate that about what's being made today, that it's, it's all disposable. I want a knife. And I don't, I don't personally care if my name is remembered throughout the ages. I don't care. But I think it would be neat uh, to look down from heaven one day and see 500 years from now, some guy pulls my knife out of the ruins of some building and sees there it is, 310 Forge Cahill, the maker's mark. That's that's neat. Uh, that's, that's the legacy I would like to leave behind. A good product. And when they look into my name, they see somebody who did their best to make a good product and somebody who genuinely cared about the craft. I make tools and I, I want to make a tool that's not disposable, but something that's generational, kind of like the gospel. So that it goes back into my philosophy. I believe that the gospel is generational, but it's to be passed on to the next generation and next generation on and on and on. Same thing with the knives. Mm -hmm. I believe it to be taken care of and passed on to the next generation. I'm so tired of seeing poor knives. So that's, that's the number one thing. If you have a good product and you, you believe in your product, it's much easier to sell. If you're just manufacturing something that you're trying to sell, you're trying to sell, sell, sell. If it's all about the sales, you're not going to get the sales unless you get lucky. And a lot of times sales is about luck, but you're not selling. I'm, I'm, I'm less selling my knives than I am myself. And I tell people that you're not just buying a knife, you're buying a bladesmith because I lifetime guarantee everything. I told you at the show, no questions asked. I stand behind the quality of my knives. And I do kind of put myself in a position there where I could potentially be in trouble if somebody breaks one. But at this point, I've made close to 4,000, sold, made and sold 4,000 knives in my career. And I've only had one guy return one. And he returned a mini scalper. He ran it over with his dually and he crushed the <laughs> And so I said, send it back. I'll fix the handle. And that was before I had uh, used good oak handles for my mini scalpers. Now I, at the lowest level of mini scalper you can get is an oak handle. Oak is indestructible. It's a tough handle. It's like hickory. Uh, but before that, I had a bunch of cypress laying around. And cypress is very beautiful. You can dye it. You can stain it. But it's just soft. And he ran it over with his truck. The knife was fine, but the handle smushed. So I told him, I told him, send it back and I'll fix it for him. So anybody who breaks one of my knives, send it back. I'll fix it. No questions asked. And I think that's what I think that should be a policy all knife makers have, but it's not. And then as far as sales go, uh, you find the people that you want to sell to. Who's your customer base? I'm not trying to sell my knives to, I don't, I don't market to the guys that are in the market for microtechs and benchmades and who collect um, 
high-end pocket knives from manufacturers. Those aren't my customers. And if they want to buy a knife, they're more than welcome to. I'm just, I don't market to them because that's not what they collect. That's not their, that's not their cup of tea. So why spend the time trying to convert somebody to, to fixed blades if they, they're not fixed blade guys. So what I do is I market to the people that I think are going to use my knives, which is mostly hunters, fishermen, um, blue collar workers, guys who have an extra hundred bucks or guys who just need a good tool that they can beat up and have fun with. And then the other uh, group are people who uh, want a special gift for somebody or somebody who understands value and longevity. So I know my audience. I know my people because I was one of them and I, I market to those people. I don't try to, I don't go outside the box. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a, uh, somebody who converts people to fixed blades or anything. I just, I know my people and I sell to those people. Yeah. And, and your people have to be knife lovers to begin with, because there are plenty of hunters and outdoorsmen who haven't used knives because they're necessary, <clears throat> but mm -hmm. are happy with Gerber. Don't ever need to look any further than cold steel. And I love cold steel. Don't get me wrong. So how, how do you find those people who actually love knives enough to care to get a, you know, a beautifully forged fixed blade? Uh, I make videos doing ridiculously awful things to the fixed blades. <laughs> like what? <laughs> what do you do? You guys, go to my face. If you go to Facebook and you type in mini scalper destruction tests, you'll see the videos that I put up. I shoot it. I baton on it. I do things to a one sixteenth inch knife that you should never do to a one sixteenth inch thick knife. And I show you, it works. You can use it and uh, you can have fun with it. You can beat it up. You, you can throw it in a tree. You can draw a circle. My brother and I used to draw circles on logs with charcoal and see who can hit the bullseye standing up down there. I think it's called mumbly peg or something. Yep. I, I want people to have a knife they're not afraid to use. And I I've, I have some knives in my collection that I am hesitant to use because I'm not confident in the steel. I keep it because it's sentimental, but I don't want to use it. Um, this is when I bought this in Spain. When I proposed to my wife, I was in Spain and I bought this beautiful Ooh. Joker Espada. Um, it was it was a good, you know, it was kind of expensive. <laughs> Uh, for me, I don't buy knives very often, but when I see one I got to have, I'll buy it. Uh, and this was a very special one. So it's sentimental, but I don't trust the steel. I think it's 420, but I don't know the heat tree. And when you go to other mm -hmm. and you're not in the knife community, see, now I can look at a knife and I can go, oh, you know, I know that company and I don't trust that heat tree. Um, but it's Joker. It's Joker, however, uh, has a pretty good reputation. And by the way, hold that up. I am a huge Navaja fan and I've never, I don't have a traditional one. I'd love to have one. God, yeah. that's beautiful. Well, it's got like a rattlesnake looking tail on it. It has a, uh, an abalone stud here and some green brass from being in the sheath. I made <laughs> <laughs> a Buffalo horn handle. And listen to this. This is great. I love it. They, uh, they don't call them Navajas there. They call them Krakas. Because when you open oh. it, cracks. Oh, yes. That's <laughs> awesome. So this is a great knife. It's super sharp, but the steel on it, I know, 420, not the greatest at edge holding. Wicked sharp. It will be incredibly sharp, but it won't stay sharp. Mm -hmm. It can tend to be brittle or it can tend to bend. So one of the two. So it kind of just stays as a pretty knife in my collection. I'll break it out every now and then. Um but it's it's not something that I I want to take out. I, it'll, it'll it'll get you through the duel, but yes. it yeah, <laughs> but it's not going to last you for too long with that. So yeah. well, so where do you stand on? I know you've done a lot of testing and stuff, but uh, where do you stand on steels? Do you um, have a couple that you love to work with the fifteen and twenty or uh, and others, or um, are you someone who's always like trying out the new? how to steal and, and seeing what that's all about. Or is that more a folder guy thing? It's more of a folder guy thing. I am not a steel snob only because of my philosophy, make a tough tool. And if you go look at the knives that the guys out there who 
they're taking their knives out and they're batoning them in logs. They're beating them up. They're, um, they're all almost always carbon steels. Guys take out their 1095 blades and baton logs with them. They don't take out their S35 VN. They take out uh, 1075 blade. Condor, knife and tool. You know Condor. Mm -hmm. uh, Condor knife and tool uses 1075 for all their hard use blades. Fin it's fin they, they have a phenomenal heat treat too. And why? Well, because it's a good steel. It holds an edge. It's inherently tougher than stainless steel. And it's easier to sharpen. Now, I, I do have preferences when it comes to my pocket knives, but I'm on the wrong end of the spectrum than your average knife nerd. I hate, I hate, hate, hate anything over D2 steel. I, there's, I don't like it. I like my OS8. I like uh, D2. And I like, um, uh, I'm okay with S35. It depends on the blade mm -hmm. and how the company heat treats it. I would rather the company heat treat it softer than harder because I, if I can't restart resharpen a knife, it's useless to me. I'm, I use my tools. I use my knives. And if I can't resharpen it, then I, I don't, I would rather a knife get dull faster and be able to resharpen it than it hold an edge for marginally longer and that's kind of been my experience my least favorite knife in my collection is my my benchmade adamas and it's in crew wear and i'll tell you what it doesn't hold an edge any better than any of my other pocket knives really? but i sharpen it i can't sharpen this knife it's a nightmare and i just gave up and i don't use it anymore but um this has become my new favorite pocket knife. It's a $20 knife, uh, and it's by a company I found on Amazon. It's kind of like uh, Civivi. It's one of those companies that's kind of popped up in the last few years. It's called Sativian. It's a $20, oh, yeah. and it's D2. And I can sharpen it. And you know what? This holds an edge way better than that Benchmade. And so I use what... every day. I know whether they hold an edge or not. This holds an edge better than that than that crew wear bench made. So like I, you can call it, uh, you, you can get all the metallurgy that you want, but when you take it out and use it and you have experience with that product and with, with the steels, you get to know what works and what doesn't. And I, knife, uh, knife steel is not, it doesn't have to be an exact science. It just needs to do what you need it to do. And that's, a, that's actually something that I, I got from a master smith. His name's Jerry Fisk. And those, if you go talk to the master smiths who are selling, who've been in the business 50 years, they've been making knives now. Jerry Fisk is one of those guys who goes out and he will take a knife that he'll sell for 10 grand and he'll go skin a deer with it. And he'll tell you, yeah, I'll take this over a million dollar knife. Why? Well, because I can sharpen it. I can re I can use it in the field and I'm not scared to use it in the field because I know its capabilities. Um, there are some steels out there that I just, I can't trust to hold an edge or to be able to resharpen. I just, I, I know it's unreasonable, but if I get stuck in the wilderness somewhere, my car breaks down and I need to use my knife, uh, but it's dull. How am I going to resharpen it? If I can't resharpen, I don't. I, what if you don't have thirty minutes to sit there with the diamond yeah. stone? Or all I've got is a rock. I want to be able to grab that piece of rock and scrape a quick edge on a knife, so I have a tool. You know. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I've always loved about one fifty four cm. To me, that's the that's kind of uh, for folders. That's kind of the magic steel because it's uh, keeps a great edge. Uh, but it's soft enough to sharpen. A lot of people over the years have used it, a lot of different custom makers, but also companies. Um, and uh, so I love that steel. Uh, the, the, the thing about the super steels and the new steels that come out is, is you know, you mentioned it, heat treat. The steel doesn't matter if it's not heat treated properly. And um, with some of the super steels that, that get really hard, that also means brittle. And if your heat treat is off a little bit, you could, you could, 
uh, mess up a whole giant batch of a huge manufacturer. So they're sheepish about it. Uh, you know, they a lot of companies tend to be sheepish about it. Um, so, you know, you're kind of not really getting your money's worth. Right. Um, and are you that much of a hard user? Now, when I met you, you had one of these in your pocket, uh, an Espada. Uh, I still large. <laughs> so is that the OS 8 or is that the S35? This was, is S35. Was... Now, this okay. was from a friend. This is like my precious. It's such favorite. a sweet. I, I love this thing. I carry it everywhere because my best friend gave it to me in a trade for one of mine. So I, you know, I can't get rid of this thing. Oh, cool. Since I saw it in Expendables, I saw that guy whip it out of his boot and throw it at the dartboard. I go, I got to have that. And it was kind of my grail knife. I could never attain. I couldn't afford it. I never had the extra cash for it. And when my friend said, hey, I'll trade you for one of your Bowie knives, I said, yes, immediately. I don't care how much. I don't I don't care if it's a fair trade. I don't care if it's an even trade. Like, I will take it. <laughs> hey, and, uh, I got I got another one here. I'll trade you for your Bowie's. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I did. I had... Um, I had found one of these. Now this knife right here actually saved my life. Uh, I, that's cold steel. So this is the, uh, the CT, this is the XHP version. And I've had some issues with this one. I actually broke the original one. The original one that I had, had the OS eight blade and it was, um, it was the bead blast. That blade actually, and that was the blade that was on it when when uh, I got I got jumped by five guys in a Walmart parking lot. And this knife saved me from them doing something really, really stupid. So they they marked me as the wrong guy. Uh, they they were looking for somebody driving the same vehicle as me, blue Dodge Dakota. And I get out of the car and these guys approach me and they're like, hey, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like. No, y'all are looking for the wrong guy. <laughs> I don't I don't know y'all. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know who you people are. And they started getting closer and closer. I didn't have my gun on me at the time because I wasn't I wasn't 21. I didn't have a license to carry. So I had one in the car, but I couldn't get to that. So I just whipped out my pocket knife and I said, okay, who wants to die first? And they go, oh. <laughs> and uh so they 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 left now that could have gone absolutely the wrong way and looking back there were a lot of things that i probably could have done to avoid that situation i prob probably could have just the car my car door was open i probably could have just hopped back in locked the door and drove driven off and been fine uh but 18 year old michael didn't have quite the same brain as you know 30 year old michael <laughs> but uh you had good lines that's a good line okay who wants to die first i mean if you're gonna pull a knife on someone you may as well have a zinger yeah my dad taught me uh if you're ever in a fight you stare right here and it does this eerie thing where it looks like you're staring into their soul because usually when you're talking to somebody you're looking in one eye or the other when you look right here, you're looking into both eyes at the same time, and it's unnerving. It's unnerving. <laughs> you can keep that. It's an intimidation tactic for most people that it'll, it'll make people either flinch or go away. I have to be careful not to do it when I'm in conversation with people because I like to keep eye contact. So I have to be conscious not to look here because it'll freak people out. So <laughs> Yeah, they'll think you're uh, you're after them when when really you're just trying to sell them a knife or like <laughs> save their soul, <laughs> something you know. Yeah. So uh, one of the things uh, actually in the um, in the buoy that you had that you made to um, process your uh, yours and your wife's miscarriage, my uh, my sympathies, by the way. Uh, what a beautiful thing to kind of pour yourself into and then and then have that and be able to carry it around. Um, one one thing that I really like about a lot of the blades I checked out that you made uh, at your table is the is the style of sheath. First of all, beautiful uh, leather sheaths, but they have that stud, so it just slides into the belt. It's not dangling or anything like that. This right, that is what I love. Yeah, they're, tell me about that style. I haven't been able to find them. <laughs> mm. uh, I've been told by other makers that they do exist. However, I haven't been able to find them. I've checked Tandy Leather. I've checked everybody. And it could be just because it's the holidays and makers are making a lot more things right now that I might not, they might not have them in stock. So 
all this is is it's a rivet that I've peened the end over. Um, you can order studs that will screw into the back or that you can rivet on that are better. But you know, for for my purposes, this works. This works okay. And yes, you just slide it into your belt, and this keeps it from going down any farther. And a lot of guys carried knives like this. If you look at World War II knives, this would this was very common. And then it would go into a a frog, which worked like this. And then the, you had a leather belt loop on this side. I, I actually have some World War One knives. I didn't think to go get it, but same thing. They have the stud, and then they have a leather sheath you can slide in like that and it keeps it from sliding any farther past that my stud design you can see this one's getting all bent up because it gets used all the time mm. the better ones are made out of stainless steel and they have a nice little rounded polished area that doesn't jab you or cut anything this is actually kind of starting to mess up my belt a little bit so i need to come up with a better solution well don't put that away because uh when you were showing it off at first, we had some video interference, which we've had a little uh, uh, sporadically here. So pull that out. Let us see that close up and uh, tell us about the the uh, pattern. Yes. Yeah, so this pattern here, I wish I had better contrast on this one. So this is a 216 layer billet. And it's a it's a pattern that I learned from Jerry Fisk. He didn't teach me. He has a he has knives and I have one of these weird brains where I can see something and I kind of know how it works to recreate it. And what you're seeing with the lines in here, it's, it's called chatoyancy. So there is a distinct pattern in the blade. And when you're looking at it like this, it doesn't look three dimensional and then you turn it and it hits the light and there's all these ripples in it. And that was something that I, I really wanted to get right. It almost looks like there's actual ripples and waves in the steel but they're not it's it's all two-dimensional it's all perfectly flat and we have this awesome term for damascus called chatoyancy <laughs> don't ask me to define it but i can show you what it is it makes a 2d object look three-dimensional or it makes a 2d pattern look three-dimensional so that's the that's the pattern that you're seeing in that in that blade which is really neat all you're doing when you're doing damascus like this is you make the billet you somewhat forge out the blade shape and then you you take i take a I take an angle grinder and a special cutting disc and I round off the edges. So then I cut the pattern in and then you go back to the press and you squish it flat and that works the pattern. So it brings the pattern to the surface. That, uh, that expression and phenomenon of chatoyancy is interesting. I, I just sort of learned it not that long ago and it was pointed out to me in wood, certain uh, kinds of burl woods and such. Um, exhibit that and and uh I, I love the word i just like to say it you know where <laughs> it it immediate it jumps your iq for me when i yeah. tell, when i get to a knife show sometimes my my southern accent comes out and it gets really thick i usually don't have a thick southern accent but when i get selling and i start getting tired i get lazy and my speech turns redneck <laughs> <laughs> uh I can I can pick a word out of my vocabulary, chatoyancy, and it, it it makes you sound like a like a smart Southern lawyer all of a yeah. sudden. <laughs> In all my years, <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 one thing I wanted to ask you. Okay, so uh, design of the buoy uh, that you had out. We talked about the blade. We talked about the pattern. I uh, you have something here that I love, and that's a Spanish notch. And uh, tell me about that flourish. So this this notch right here actually is not a Spanish notch. This would be okay. this would be more of a sprue notch. Um, let me get the one that has a Spanish notch to show you. So a Spanish notch historically, before there were makers marks and before it was common for people to stamp their name into a blade, almost like the Japanese. When you see the hamon in a Japanese style blade, you would know who the maker is. It was just a calling card for the maker. This right here is a Spanish notch. Oh, cool. Put it on my forehead so you can see the contrast. That's a Spanish notch. So when you forge a blade, when you forge out a knife and you forge the bevel, you end up with this rounded portion right here. And that's, that's a process from the hammering. You're hammering it out. It's squishing the metal. It becomes rounded. So it's, it's, it's just how knives are forged. Now, 
knife makers, the Spanish knife makers would use the opportunity to make something special out of it. And that would be the calling card of that Spanish knife maker. So that's where you get the notch. It's simply an embellishment. It serves no function but to make the blade look beautiful. Okay. I I was under the impression that it was to catch a blade. You know, when you're going <laughs> blade to blade. and that, uh... It can be. Uh, but in this instance right here, this is more common that you'll see this on a bagwell buoy. Or you'll even see it a lot of times on a patch knife. What this is intended to be is a sprue notch. It's a historical addition to a knife that's kind of one of those things you don't really need it's kind of like a can opener on a swiss army knife who actually uses that okay uh you might if you're an avid camper and you just need it but no one really uses it today it's simply something to break the pattern i use it uh today as a as a nice place to to stop my 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 grind and it's a it's a place you can set the knife and know this is where i begin uh, sharpening. So it's a way for me to start a sharpening because if, if you don't have something that breaks it up like this, then you can tend to get that swoopy pattern as you sharpen a knife for years and years. If you look right. at a pocket knife, you end up with almost a recurve. This mitigates that. But a sprue notch historically in the 19th century, when guns began, uh, people started using and casting lead balls for firearms there was always a, a a little piece of lead that stuck up off the top and a sprue notch was where you could take your knife put the little sprue that stuck up off the lead ball and you could knock it off so you didn't use the edge and you had a dedicated spot on your weapon or on your knife to to do that oh that is so cool i i i had no idea i love that um yeah i i love the uh Americanness of the Bowie knife. I love these uh, uh, looking at our history through our knives, and you can do that with a lot of different cultures. But we have an especially interesting one um, because of how many different influences uh, went into uh, everything that you know is yeah. American. What what besides the Bowie it, uh, do you like to make? Um, in terms of large forged knives? Um, I wish I had one. I sold it at my last show that I went to. Hudson Bay, uh, camp knives. Yes. Yeah. So something that is going to be a tool. Any? So what do you consider a large knife? Well, uh, uh, Hudson Bay is actually exactly what I was hoping you would say because... Uh, I, I I love that knife, and to me, it's sort of like a buoy, but it's also sort of like a kitchen knife. It's also sort of like a camp knife. It's it's a it's the do all knife for a trapper. So this is as close as I can get for you. This is this is like um, this is a mix between a coffin handled guardless buoy and a trade knife. So you have you have a shelf here that goes off. Here I actually have a a dropped point, but this is, this is kind of like that. Um, the Hudson Bay, obviously much larger blade, wider, thicker. Uh, this is as close as I can get to that. Let me see what else I have in here to represent that. I, I like the concept of trade knife. Can you, can you yeah. uh, flesh that out a little? A trade knife is a term that came about in, I believe, the 17th or 18th century when we were trading things with the Native Americans. So it was any knife that came from a manufacturer overseas to the colonies or to any of the English colonies. So a trade knife could be in India. A trade knife could be in any of the colonies here in the United States. Any of the English colonies, that's where that term came from. So a trade knife honestly has so many different things that it could be it was just what was manufactured to be used for commerce and trade and then today we look at it and go yes that was a common trade knife okay okay i so, I, I i took it for something different <laughs> had their own the english had their own the indians have their own everybody has their own uh trade knife Okay, well, if you had to uh, look into the future, we know what the kind of the history of American knives are. 
uh what's the future what did, what what happens with american knives in the future i don't even know i'm just praying that they don't outlaw knives like they do in the uk that's that's just that's my don't go there <laughs> Because you can get arrested for having your uh, if you ever watch the TV shows or you watch the the border police in any of those countries, man, you've they've got a pocket knife. They have a Swiss Army knife. They are a hardened criminal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and when it was just so common to have a pocket knife, I think a man should have a pocket knife. It's a great tool. But you go insane and you outlaw man's oldest tool. What do you? do to move on from there <laughs> so yeah. I, america doesn't do that now are you are you talking where do you think uh, like style wise everything's going to go yeah that's really what i'm getting at um i i think that people will continue moving on towards folding knives i i don't think folding knives are ever going to change so it, it it doesn't seem like there's always a progression. It seems like there's a cycle. I, it, it sales that I've noticed in in knife community, there's always a trend, and the trends are cyclical. Sometimes people like the big knives, like the cold steel folders, and the big Bowie knives. And I remember when I first started knife making, the big thing was having the most useful one tool option survival knife. And everybody out there was getting Ontario rats and um, uh, Becker Bowie knives. And if you didn't have a BK9, were you really a survivalist? <laughs> if you were you going to make it? You know, so that, but now people have gone away from that. And I love Busey knives who are, are really an amazing knife to me, but you don't really see those anymore unless you see somebody who loves walking dead and just got a Gemini because they, they wanted you know, to say they have the walking dead knife, but I see trends. I see people get moving more towards concealable weapons and tools and more, more like case and gentleman pocket knives, as opposed to having a large tactical folding knives. That seems to be where things are headed right now. Uh, I, I, take solace in the fact that we have 350 million guns guarding our knives you know maybe uh ho hopefully that puts us in a good spot in terms of uh any sort of laws uh against we're lucky we have knife rights you know uh, uh doug ritter who has changed the laws in uh with his organization knife rights uh, 34 states i think and i know virginia is one of them um, yeah and uh it's been great but yeah i i I'm with you. I think uh, more folder carriers. I think that's uh, I think that's why there are so many knife collectors these days is uh, the folder market is so broad and yes. folders are easier to carry. But um, but there are a lot of people like me who like lit. I mean, I'm obsessing over case knives and other uh, slip joints right now. Uh, and I'll turn around and I'll buy a Bowie knife. You know, I I, I love it all. Um, and I think that's where, uh, you know, makers like you, uh, can, can really, you know, step in and, and open minds, uh, uh, especially in terms of those, because people love knives period. And, uh, you know, you're not going to find a, someone who collects folders, who looks at a fixed blade and is like, Oh, I don't like that. Like, I think there's a barrier there where people want to carry a fixed blade. What man doesn't want to carry a knife on their hip? I'm sorry. If you tell me I don't like to carry a knife on your hip, I think you just haven't figured out where you're, what knife you want to carry on your hip. And if yeah. you, it's a confidence. It's a, uh, why did, why do, why are, why is every man obsessed with swords? <laughs> yeah group tonight i bought a uh i i have foam swords that i use at youth group one of them it was the the, the sword from the witcher the one he kills the monsters with i have a foam version i brought that the youth group tonight <laughs> boys and girls all of us we we one person was blindfolded i made an arena out of tables and <laughs> blindfolded person had to get everybody else in the square just they saw the sword and they go oh a sword there's it's so ingrained in our in our nature to 
want a sword. I don't, <laughs> it's primal. It is. It's very. It's, it's self-reliance and the desire to protect people we love. And yeah. then also they're just cool. Uh, they hey, uh, Michael. So um, tell people how they can find you and find your work and uh, and get in touch with you if they want to buy a knife. Sure. Uh, best way to get a hold of me is through my Facebook page. It's at 310 Forge, 310 Forge. And it has the logo that he put up at the beginning of the podcast, the white logo with a blacksmith standing at an anvil, uh, just 310 Forge. And it's on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. My website is 310forge.square.site. However, that's not the best way to get a hold of me. I, I, for whatever reason, Square is very annoying <laughs> and doesn't like iPhones. So if you send me an email or a message through Square, I might not get it. I, I have missed messages from people from there before. So best way to get a hold of me is to message me. My phone number is on my Facebook. I'm a very open person. Uh, I don't have anything to hide. So why, you know, why bother? My, my, my cell phone's on there. Email should be there. And best way to get a hold of me is through Facebook. Uh, my videos, I post mostly through Facebook. Instagram, I guess, is having issues with knives right now. Or they just get in shadow banned. So I haven't devoted a lot of time to my Instagram. But you, you're more than welcome to message me there. And my TikTok is 310forge as well. Real simple. No underscores, no caps, just 310forge. And I, I'm trying to post to that and get a little better at TikTok as well. Uh, I would say your your web page is awesome for checking out all your different models. You have a lot of beautiful photographs of your work there, so a great place to check out for reference. It is, and it is, for whatever reason, Square is not a very friendly site for updating quickly. It is very <laughs> difficult to get time. And uh, like I told you, all the knives that I had at Texas Custom Knife Show, they're almost all gone. I have a few of the expensive customs left, but my knives move in and out so fast. It's very difficult to keep the website up to date. The best way to ask, like to see what's available is to check Facebook, see something you like there, message and be like, Hey, screenshot it. I like this knife. How much? And then I can make you an invoice through square. So I still do my business through square. It's just very difficult to keep the website up to date with how many knives are coming in and out right now. Great problem to have. Michael Cahill of 310 Forge, thank you so much, sir. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Absolutely. You know you're a knife junkie if you're as happy as a kid on Christmas morning when that new knife arrives in the mail. <laughs> it's true. I am every time. Doesn't matter what it is either. Uh, there he goes. Michael Cahill of 310 Forge. Man, I got to say that uh, slender, black-handled Bowie uh Mm, buoy sorry uh i love that um it just has my my wheels my gears spinning uh i i gotta i gotta get me i gotta get me a custom forged buoy that can slip right in my belt but what, we'll talk about that another time all right uh it was great talking with him and uh until i get that bowie i have this to to hold me in good stead 310 forge making awesome knives be sure to check in with us next Sunday for another conversation with a great knife person, Wednesday for the midweek supplemental, and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.